Okay, guys. Um, so let us start. I know a few people will um, dial in late. And for anyone who isn't in South Africa, we've had two weeks of major drama and lots of people are, you know, trying to sort out their lives. And um, I know we've got load shedding in a few areas. So um, I'm sure we'll have some people dropping in late. But um, we are super excited um, for tonight's um, guest speaker. But let me open up our weekly drone date with Women and Drones Africa. This is what we call our fireside chat for anyone who is new to our um, weekly drone date. Oh, I see Desi's um, had to dial back in. So this is our friendly forum where we learn, we inspire, we share, um, and we have amazing guest speakers from all over the world, actually, um, but mainly Africa, where we celebrate, we celebrate um, achievements, we share things that people are doing, and um, we, we learn and we get inspired every week. And so I am super, super excited to have a very, very good friend um, of ours, of mine, um, presenting today. And um, Tawanda is, um, he's phenomenal. So based in Zimbabwe, um, Tawanda kind of has a rap sheet of notes of everything that he's done. And basically, um, instead of reading all these things, what I would just freewheel and say is that um, Tawanda essentially is um, a trailblazer in the African drone industry. And in fact, he goes by the African drone professional. Um, Tawanda has a, um, a company called Precision Aerial Group. And he's also um, the, uh, the head of the Zimbabwe Flying Labs. They are doing amazing work with training, with operations, and of course, also humanitarian stuff. Um, Tawanda has written um, and co-authored chapters in Louise Jupp's um, Drone Professional 1 and 2. Tawanda has spoken on many, many um, uh, platforms and conferences, etc. And the big thing we are celebrating, which I think he's going to tell us more about um, today, is in, yeah, a few weeks ago, he won the JCI Global Creative Young Entrepreneur Award for Africa and the Middle East region. And we are so thrilled because Tawanda and his team have bootstrapped, have have hustled, have been professional, have led the way, and um, things are just flying <laughs> for Tawanda and his team. And so Tawanda, um, please, please um, take the floor and tell us more about what you're doing. We are so pleased to have you here. Welcome. Awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Kim. Thank you, Louise, for having me uh, on the Fireside Chat today. Um, always an honor and a privilege just to be on any platform um, and just to speak and share about some of the cool things that we're doing. Um, this is Women and Drones. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, a lot of the, you know, uh, the people who come here every week, you know, it's, you know, it's really a platform, you know, that is super important. And I think also imbibes the heart of just knowledge sharing and helping each other on their journey. Um, so yeah, so besides that, uh, interesting introduction. Um, it's always kind of embarrassing. Like, it's like, okay, then you're doing the whole rap sheet. And it's like, okay, you've done this, you've done this, you've done that. And then it's like, oh, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> I, it, it almost feels like you're talking about someone else um, most of the time. So, but really thankful and really, you know, privileged just to have this journey and this chance just to speak to you guys. So I think um, for today, um, I know we could talk about a lot of different things, but what I think that's on my heart to share about is, yeah, first of all, just in terms of the award and what happened and how we came up to that space and, um, you know, and also maybe more of an encouragement, I think, towards the end is just so that we can 
um, as a network, as a community, grow in our spaces. And I know we're pursuing drones in different ways. Some are operators, some are trainers, some are repair and maintenance technicians and that kind of thing. Um, but all at the same time, you know, we share a love and appreciation of this technology and the impact that it's having um, in our different spaces. Um, so to everyone, um, yes, yeah, so welcome uh, to this platform. And I think just to give you a bit of a background um, about this award and what happened, I was chatting with Kim the other day and I was like, okay, I'll tell, I'll tell the full story. Um, but for the most part, I think to get it started is, is uh, just sharing about the importance of, of friends and having people who are within your network and in your space who are looking out for you and who are thinking of you whenever there's like an opportunity that suits you know, or meets what you're doing. Um, it's important to have the right people or you know, tell your friends that people should know about what you're doing and that kind of thing. Um, so this award thing um, was run by an organization called JCI. It's called Junior Chamber International. Um, and they're an international organization. Um, they are involved in helping uh, professionals, uh, be it in the finance, marketing, HR, whatever kind of profession you're involved with. It's a community of people who help um, each other, they do public speaking training, they help people start up businesses, they help them, you know, with projects, they do also community initiatives, and it's more like a professional's network for young business people. So um, they have chapters all over the world, um, I think in probably just over 150 countries around the world now. Uh, so the International uh, is pretty big. So they come up with this competition. They do a whole bunch of other things. They've got a lot of uh, different initiatives that they run, but they came up with what's called the Creative Young Entrepreneurs Award. So it's an idea that they came up with and said, look, we want to try and help find, help try and find what, what they're calling the next unicorn, okay? So we know what a unicorn is. It's a business that is valued at, I think a billion dollars or something like that. Yeah, the classification of a unicorn. Um, so they're trying to help see if they can, you know, within the network, within the space, encourage more people to set up or to come up with, you know, businesses that will, you know, obviously become one of the big, you know, uh, businesses to talk about. Um, so they came up with this award. It's a global award. Um, and then they broke it up into different continents and regions. And they reached out to all the community, all the different country chapters. So JCI Zimbabwe, in this case, uh, they ran the local competition. I'm sure there's JCI South Africa as well. Um, and basically what happened, I didn't know about this. I'm not part of JCI, so that you know, I'm not part of it. Okay, I know about it, but I'm not part of it. Okay, I probably, I probably should join now, I think. Might be, <laughs> might be a good idea. Um, but anyway, so the JCI president, right? So they have presidents and vice presidents. I think Sharon will know because Sharon's in the US. So in the US, they have vice presidents, senior vice presidents of, you know, of companies. Here we have like, yeah, directors and you know, heads of whatever. So anyway, so the president of the Zimbabwe chapter happens to be a former workmate of mine, right? Um, so where I used to work in corporate um, and where I used to work for like 10 years. Um, anyway, so I happened to go back to the space where I used to work and I met her. And then she's like, hey, aren't you doing, like I'm, I follow your cool stuff that you're doing with drones. You should apply for this thing. And literally I'm in the middle of doing training. So we're doing training uh, for one of our clients who, is, who owns like a diamond mine. So we're doing some training for the, um, the guys with the surveyors and that kind of thing. So we're, we're about to leave town. So I was literally going to go out of town for, I think, about a week and a half. And then she says to me, you should apply to this thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, send it to me. I'll think about it uh, with no intention of applying because I'm like, I'm too busy. All right. So anyway, she sends me an email, sends me the details. I'm like, okay, I left it. I went, I'm out on a mine. Network is like bad. The deadline comes up for this thing. And she starts phoning me and saying, where's your application? I look at the thing and then I'm like, oh no, the application, what they wanted from, from us as applicants was to submit a business plan. Number one, a full business plan with financials and all sorts of things, as well as a video pitch, right? Of your idea. So in my mind, I'm like, what do I pitch? Do I pitch the whole business? Like we're doing a lot of things. What do I pitch? So the thing that came to, to mind at the time was like, okay, let me pitch the thing that's closest to my heart right now. And we had just, just, just launched probably about a week or two before that. We had just launched our drones and STEM education program. So this is a program where we're going into trying to go into schools and reach out to 
kids between seven to 18 years old and start teaching them about drones and coding and use case applications and that kind of thing. So we've just launched this thing, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pitch that because I can't pitch everything. I can't pitch like the whole idea. I can't talk about a drone business because there's nothing new. It's not new, do you know what I mean? Right, in terms of just saying drone operations and services. So anyway, um, I frantically put together some business plan, right? Um, and this, my friend of mine is hounding me. Please note, guys, I did not want to apply. I was like, you know what? I'm so busy. Let me just focus on what I'm doing right now. This is not a priority. And she pushed me. And then when she saw, like, I stopped answering her calls, she sent other people to push me, <laughs> to, like, tell me, to, like, can I have the application? I mean, it's crazy the way it worked out. Anyway, long story short, I submit my application. I was super surprised, got shortlisted. Uh, amongst the finalists. So shortlisted amongst finalists for the Zimbabwe uh, appli applications. They submitted to the region, regional one. I was shortlisted again, uh, ended up being in the top six. Um, and they went to the final stage of this competition for the Africa region. So anyway, the final competition now um, was a pitch, right? Where we're pitching just like this on Zoom. And they had six judges from different, from different countries, different companies, organizations, ETC from all around the world, ETC. Um, so anyway, uh, we basically had five minutes. So you're basically kind of like elevator pitch or, or people talk about elevator pitch, whatever. Anyway, I had like five minutes and they had a timer. So at five minutes, they were like cut off everyone. So anyway, they've seen the business plan, right? Cause you've sent it, you've seen the video pitch. Now they're like, you need to sell yourself. You need to sell the idea and like win us over, right? So anyway, cool, did that, did my, my piece. Uh, scrambled together some sort of mini presentation like <laughs> five minutes before. Um, anyway, did my pitch and then I got grilled. They grilled me. I mean, they grilled everyone else, but like they, some of them, like I'm like, some of them, I actually thought I was like, oh, maybe these guys don't like me. The way they asking me these questions, <laughs> they were grilling me. And then they're like, oh, why did you apply to this thing? Oh, okay, so how come you haven't done this? And how come you haven't done that? And what are you gonna do if you win? You know, what, what, you know, what impact, what, what's this, what scale, what, you know, what are you thinking of? What, what does it look like five years from now? And I'm like, okay, okay. Um, okay. So I'm like, okay, no, I want to do this. I want to do that. We want to reach out and, blah, blah, blah. and they're like, okay, fine, fine, fine. Then uh, one of them actually asked me, one of the judges was a lady from one of the judges, one of the six judges was a lady who works for IBM, right? Um, and she starts grilling me and saying, okay, do you know about regulations? Do you know that operating drones is, uh, is, you know, requires you to understand regulations and know the things? And I'm like, yeah, um, actually, you know what? I, I hadn't told you that I'm actually, you know, a commercial drone operator, a licensed pilot or whatever it is. So I'm like, yeah, I think I'm, I'm okay when it comes to regulations. So I'm, I explained to her, I'm like, actually, no, I'm a pilot. I'm actually an instructor. I do this, I've been doing that and that. And then she's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. All right. And then anyway, long story short, she says to me, she's like, afterwards, she's like, hey, can we have a chat afterwards, right? This is outside the competition. She's just like, hey, can we talk, right? About what you're doing and, and that kind of thing. So it was really cool. Anyway, did the pitch. Uh, the results came through two, day, two days later. Again, like I'm saying, I was super busy. So when I pitched, I literally pitched like, um, I was traveling the next day. So I traveled out of town the next day. I had an agriculture mapping thing, job, or whatever that we had to do. So I left. So the results came in. I didn't, I couldn't even attend the, res the announcement, I think, because I was out of town. And then my phone starts ringing and people start saying, uh, screaming, oh, you won. I'm like, oh, wow, shocked, right? Super surprised, <clears throat> okay? And I guess the reason why I'm talking and sharing about this is, Really, uh, one, obviously, because we won because of drones, okay? And drones, it's, yes, I won the award, but what won was the idea and the work that we're doing within that space and it being something that is unique, something that's important and something that really has tangible or will have um, tangible impact um, to the lives of young people. And as we talk about conversations about getting, you know, people job ready for the future of work. You know, so really honored, really privileged. Uh, what the win actually means, this award, it means then that um, I'll be representing Africa and the Middle East at the global final award with the winners of the other continents, Europe, Americas, whatever, whatever it is in November. Okay, All right, <clears throat> All right. And yeah, there was a little bit of, a little bit of prize money. Yeah, 
but that's only coming like at the end of the year. But anyway, look, I mean, super, super privileged, super, um, you know, happy that I've had that opportunity and that privilege. But really my encouragement there is to say, you know, like I said at the beginning is who are your friends? Who are the people who you're connected to in your network? And I mean, that's also the power of, you know, networks and platforms like this, Women and Drones, is that, you know, it's a platform and a place where hopefully we can get to a space where we're not, and I know we're not competing with each other. I know that. But are we looking out for each other when we see opportunities and are we actively looking and saying, look, you know what? Um, I'm an operator, but here's an opportunity for someone who's a repair and maintenance technician or someone who's in training. Let me connect them. Let me do this. And let me push them <laughs> to get into these spaces because we're all needing to grow from where we are right now. And I know in our individual spaces, sometimes it's like, okay, um, I'm just trying to, you know, do what I'm doing right now. And you're so focused and it could be a project. It could be a client. It could be something that you're trying to fix or repair, or you're just trying to move to the next step. But really the people around us are so important and so key and they help us grow and move from, you know, where we are and get to the next step and next stage. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> uh, Kim and I, Kim and I always talk about like, like LinkedIn and social media and the, the you know, and the importance of sharing your story and telling your story. In, in the scope of the things that I think we've done in terms of advancing the industry, the drone industry in Zimbabwe, this has probably been so small in comparison, right? But it's the thing that's made so much noise. I was shocked. I just put it on there. I'm like, okay, cool. We won. Great. Everyone's just like, amazing. This is cool. And then a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know you're into drones. I didn't know. You know what I mean? So it's brought attention to the things that we're trying to do, where we were trying so hard to get, get into spaces and conversations and that kind of thing. I mean, civil aviation in Zimbabwe, uh, the guys who were there, they were like, you know, they actually reached out and they're like, oh, congratulations. And I'm like, oh, you noticed that we actually exist? Oh, it's good to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, so you, you never know who's watching, you never know who's, you know, and, and how one opportunity can lead to the next and how things can happen. So it may not come necessarily specifically in the space and the things that you're working in right now, um, but you never know what is the thing that's gonna really, I guess, blow up uh, in a sense um, in itself. So, so that's that's really the story about the award. Um, and I guess our work within the drone space and the drone industry is we are more so focused now on on training, you know, um, which you know Kim was was sharing about earlier is we're really looking at how do we train the next, well, this, the, this generation of uh, remote pilots to be able to be job ready and to actually get into the space uh, where once they have their RPL, right? And the additional training that they need, then they're able to get into a space where they can go straight to work and actually be able to bring value to whichever organization they're gonna be a part of, or if they're gonna do their own startup, right? At least let's give them the tools to be ready for that. So yeah, so that's my story um, in a nutshell. Um, don't know if you have any questions. I wonder, you know, we could listen to you for hours because your passion and your stickability and your knowledge just shines through. And so for anyone who's on here, who has not had a conversation with Tawanda, um, that's, I think, what, you know, is so attractive is that, you know, you, you've you started from nothing in this industry, like a lot of us have, right? You kind of just go, okay, I fall into this somehow, and you just have, you know, blossomed, and, and you're still hustling, and you're punching your way through this, but how freaking awesome. Um, and Desi says, congratulations, love your story, how you are moving the industry forward and your enthusiasm. And that just, you know, oozes out of you. Um, in fact, I want to show you guys something. Um, um, obviously, you know, it goes without saying, and, I, and I've said this to Tawanda before, you know, just how even just your your tone and your voice and your accent and everything is just so attractive. Um, and so I want to... <laughs> I want to share my screen. Um, Ella, Ella just sent this through. Can you see my screen? <laughs> this is Ella's cat who is sitting on her laptop and she says, my cat loves to wonder. <laughs> I thought I would just make you laugh. I'm sorry, Ella. 
But um, it's so interesting how we've had a number of um, conversations and and um, and conferences where people send me little screenshots of animals like crawling up onto their laptop or sitting on on their on their screen or whatever. So I thought that was just a cute little thing to share. Sorry, Ella, I just shared your little secrets, but I thought it was so interesting. She's like, my cat loves to wonder. <laughs> Um, so I wonder, um, I, I was going to ask you, you know, what this win means. And mm. so you, you already um, shared that with us. So congratulations. This is just awesome. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes a win like this maybe doesn't even mean as much to you and the industry, mm. like you say, suddenly people are just going, wow, this is great. But, you know, that just, it might be one person who stumbles upon it, who thinks that there's another thing that can lead from that. And, and the next thing, what do you know? You know, you've got a, an investor or you've got a, you know, a new opportunity for your business, which is, which is just amazing. So well, well done. And I'm glad your friend hounded you for that. Um, <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you about your, your story, I watched the YouTube documentary that um one of the what a journalist in Zimbabwe um did or produced on you and it's your story and um I'm gonna actually put the link in here so if anyone has an hour of wanting to know more about Tawanda's story please please um watch it it's just so cool and well put together but can you tell us and I've I meant to write it down. I forget now, and I don't want to mispronounce it. But can you tell us your story of of how you funded the start of your business? Or oh, do you know? No. <laughs> it, it's on YouTube. It's public. <laughs> is it called Jig? J no, it's not Jigga Jigga, is it? What's it called? Um, Shika Shika. But Shika Shika. <laughs> there you go. Oh, tell, okay. tell us about your Shika Shika story. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, all right. I'm seeing some some people here from different parts of the world. So I'm trying to see context here. Um, I can see Nelly, Nelly's from Kenya. Hi, Nelly. Um, we've definitely got US. Yeah, US. And we've got South Africa. I don't know where America. else is everyone from. Okay. Um, so, so for context, Mshika Shika um, is like a, some people call it like Tuk Tuk, like a Tuk Tuk. Uh, Desi is USA. Uh, what are these funny little things? Oh, anyway, nearly you know you know what it's called in thing. But there's little like you know like little um, it's not like a little motorbike thing, but like transport and that kind of thing. For us here in Zimbabwe, we have what we call like mshika shika. So it's like informal taxi service um, or a cab, an informal cab. So it's like an unregistered cab, um, which basically takes people from point A to point B and that kind of thing. Not Uber. Well, as you did say, Uber. Uber's Uber. It's basically service. like a little like a little motorbike with a with a little cab on the back for like two people, right? Yeah, something like that um, in context. But in Zimbabwe, it's like an actual car, but like a small car, right? Yeah. So, so, so Uber, Uber is sophisticated. I mean, like, yeah, there's Uber in South Africa and whatever, but Uber is like, no, that's good. <laughs> it's not that. It's not as glamorous as that. Um, so anyway, so at the time I was working full time. So I was employed, um, you know, working in the corporate space and that kind of thing. So. Uh, the way I got involved in drone tech, I think it was pro probably 2015 when we started doing, you know, just general in terms of the awareness about drones around drones, 2016. Um, 2016, yeah, I'll put it in the chat, Daisy, I can see that, yeah, so she can Google it. <laughs> it's not official, but <laughs> it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put it there so you can Google it, uh, right? Um, but about 2016, we started um, and got involved in the drone racing space. So we started Zimbabwe's first drone racing community. So that, that was my entry point into the, into the drone industry, right? Uh, drone racing. So what my co-founder at the time, we started what's called Drone Racing Zimbabwe. Um, we basically would like buy parts from China and that kind of thing and import them and then assemble like racing drones. So we assembled like two of them. We bought a couple of racing drones. Uh, before we actually started seeing and getting to the commercial, you know, the commercial and oh, we offer services ETC, we had about 14 racing drones. Um, and basically we would then start having like events, right? Um, so we started hosting events and we'd go to like, um, what you call it, school fairs and that kind of thing. And we would basically take our drones and go and like 
let kids fly them and like start trying to teach them about drones, even though we didn't know much back then about drones. Anyway, long story short, we started doing that and we did that for about a year, year and a half. We'd host events. We would basically do it, bootstrap it, self-fund, right? So these drones. We would go there and be like, try and make the kids pay to say, hey, can you pay five bucks to learn how to or try and fly? And then the kids were like, no, I want to fly, but I don't have any money. And then in the end, we ended up not even charging, right? We just wanted them to experience it and fly the drones and that kind of thing, you know? So we'd had about maybe four events in total. Um, and we would pay for the repairs, pay for the setup, pay for the venue costs, whatever it is to be there. And it just wasn't sustainable. There's no business model behind the heart of what we were trying to do, right? Which is educate, train, and get people involved and hopefully get the interest up um, to a point where we could have people, uh, hi, can you still hear me? I think it's me. Oh, you can, okay, great. Oh, so yes. Kim yeah. froze. Okay, oh, sorry, okay, I saw Kim froze, so I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, so once we found and we saw that it wasn't sustainable to continue doing that, right, on our own, we had to have a business model around that, okay? And then I said to myself, you know what? I was involved in the FPV community. We were connecting with people from the US um, and we connected with, at the time, uh, DRL, I don't know those of you who, I mean, Sharon, you'll know, DRL um, with Nicholas Herbowski, uh, who's head of DRL. I mean, we connected with him back in 2016 when they were still building that up and that kind of thing, right? Um, and, you know, we had a conversation and we're like, oh, we'd love to have a drone racing event, even in Zimbabwe and that kind of thing, you know, but we didn't have the sponsorship and support and the interest enough for us to do that. So I made the decision to say, look, I'm going to have to leave the FPV world, move over to drones, the commercial side. And to be honest, as an FPV pilot, FPV pilots look at like us commercial drone pilots very differently, right? FPV pilots are like, we're the skilled ones because they do these crazy maneuvers and it's really high skill, high, like high octane kind of, you know, flying, um, you know, and FPV pilots will always tell you they're way better pilots than, you know, obviously commercial drone pilots, they'll always say that. All right. So that was kind of my attitude. I was like, nah, these guys, they're flying DJI drones where they press a button and it just goes, hovers and does all sorts of things. They're like, that's not flying drones. You need to do FPV and fly real drones. Anyway, so moved over to commercial side, right? And for the commercial side of things, right? When looking at the commercial um, drone space, how we got involved and where the story comes in with them shika shika cars is that I was employed at the time um, using whatever excess money I had to do this, but now to start investing in a DJI drone. And for the most part, for context, uh, for those in the US and other countries, in the US, you can get like a Phantom 4 Pro, for example, for like, I don't know, 1,700, 1,800, um, you know, off the shelf. In this part of the world, you pay double that, okay? That's the cost of it, all right? So now that was going to cost like, yeah, so it's, you're looking at about $3,000, um, that you would need to invest. And I didn't have that. That was, that's, that, you know, is a lot of money and was a lot of money at the time. So what I did is that, uh, my friend, my cousin, sorry, my cousin was selling his car. So his car was like, a, like an old car beat up type of thing. And there was this trend going around now, these informal taxis, right. That were providing a service to people. So I didn't have the money to pay for the car. I didn't have the money to buy a drone. So I said to my cousin, look, I'll pay you monthly installments, give me your car, can I have it? It's a to sell it. I'll pay you monthly installments and pay you off until the car is you know, sold off. So I did that. Um, then I got myself like a driver. I didn't drive the car myself. Okay, I actually hired like someone and got a driver. And basically we would do these shuttle taxi things uh, for just over a, almost a year. Yeah, almost a year, I think. We managed to pay off the car and managed to turn over profit. So I could buy this $3,000 drone, right? to get us started. That's how we bought our first uh, Phantom 4. That was now 2017, okay? Um, and that was it. And then we registered the business and that kind of thing. Then started trying to get, you know, formalized and get licensing and da, da, da. But that's, that's how we started. Um, yeah, and that's, I guess, our, our journey. And we've just been growing since. You know, it's a wonder, sorry, I dropped off because we now have load shedding. So now oh. I'm on my hotspot with my phone torch as lighting. So anyway, um, I see Louise has dropped off as well. So I think we've, I don't know, maybe she's got load shedding too. Um, so, you know, this that story and the reason why I called it out is because, you know, that's true entrepreneurship. 
you know, you needed to buy this drone to get started and you made a plan. And, you know, um, Irvin Peniane, who's the chairperson of the Drone Council South Africa, um, we were on, a, on an update call with our members uh, last week. And, you know, one thing that was called out was that a lot of people want to start in this business, but there's no funding. You know, the funding agencies aren't funding, the funding's not available, people need to buy drones, they need licensing, etc. cetera. And, um, and he literally said, he said, listen, if we all wait for funding, we'll wait a long time. Mm -hmm. So we need to, and what, he wasn't saying like start anyway, but he was saying start anyway, start somehow, you know, and, and you did it. And it was most probably really, really hard, you know, um, but that just shows true, true entrepreneurship, which is just such, you know, such a good thing to see. But I think the other thing that you've done really well is that um, you've got you've got um, passion for what you do. But you've also in the way that I always say, you've put your arms around the industry. You've made connections with the um, regulators, the regulators now look to you for advice um and uh and how awesome that they were actually you know there at those presentations and you know have kind of reached back out to you so you know it, it's it's all very well saying okay i have a drone and you know how we talk about it sometimes you have a drone and the license okay now i have the solution let me go look for a problem to solve you know you you really are driving a lot of what's going on in the industry which is just so fantastic and it will pay off for sure um and uh i think for context for anyone who doesn't know i know in south africa we always talk about the strict regulations and you know we can't move without the regulator and and it really does hold us back sometimes but in zimbabwe the regulations have been set they've been promulgated but if I'm articulating it correctly to wonder, um, they haven't been rolled out yet to the point where it can be um, enforced or where people can actually officially apply. So it's actually easier just to do this unregulated, right? So that's, tell us a little bit more about how you're competing against an informal market per se. Yeah. Um... You know, it's 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 a it's a very interesting um, kind of space we're in. You know, like like you've mentioned, is that um, how do you how do you I guess how do you come across and be a professional in a space where it's you're filled with people who are not professionals or acting professional in in their conduct? It's for us, it's it's really been just an ongoing journey, and you know, conversations we've been having, especially with some aviation, is. It's not so much that they don't want to implement the regulations, but they're limited because of, you know, budget and funding and that kind of thing. So they're standing on the sidelines. They're like, look, you know, things aren't going to happen until ABCD is in place. Um, so you can imagine the space we're in is we've had regulations since 2018. Our regulations are very similar to South Africa's. And for context, for those also on the call is um you know the requirement for you to operate uh, drones commercially here is you have to have a license right licensed pilot um a little bit, it's quite yeah it's different to your part 107 and i'm sure you guys have talked about this um in, you know in context here is the difference between part 107 and the rpls yeah um but you know you have to go through like official training and then you also have to have a, an ROC um, or OPAS operator certificate for those who are wanting to operate as a business and that kind of thing it's the same here in zimbabwe except that um, no one has that, right? There's no means, there are no training schools, right? There are no um, you know, means to get an, an ROC or a certificate for you to actually operate commercially and you know, show that and prove that you can actually do things properly. So you'll find that in this space, um, the challenge that we're finding the most is you're competing and coming across and trying to bring forward standards that people don't even know exist and people don't know there should be standards for it. So a drone is still being seen so much, you know, a lot, a lot of the companies still see drones as like a, as a tool to, you know, to just take photos and videos, right? It's, it's, it's really like an aerial camera, that's all, right? 
That's, that's the extent of it. It's either a toy or an aerial camera and oh, anyone can fly it. Anyone can do it. And most of the people even, you, you'll hear even like CEOs of companies of big companies, like, you know, listed companies, right? And these big corporates, they'll be like, oh, I've got, my son's also got a drone. I bought my son a drone. So what are you doing that special? Do you know what I mean? Like they look at it like, nah, right? You, you need a license? A lot of people are like, oh, you need a license? What does that even mean? You know, type of thing. So we're coming across at a space where we're like, we're trying to encourage the civil aviation to do public awareness campaigns, right? And to tell the public to say, hey guys, there are standards required, right? There's safety to consider. This is aviation. We're in the aviation space here. It's not just a toy. It's not just a camera that you can just do whatever you want to do with it, right? There are ethical um, approaches to how we operate. There are safety concerns that must be considered whenever you operate. So, you know, we're in that space and we're trying to encourage civil aviation because I can't go out to market and police people and say, hey, 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 hey. All I can do is encourage and say, guys, here's the standard. Here's how things should be done, which is what we're constantly doing on social media, in some of the webinars, some of the workshops that we run in conversations with people, with other pilots or other owners, drone owners. We're trying constantly to do that. Um, and one of the biggest challenges there, and I can see Ella wants to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, one, one of the biggest things there that's coming now is the challenge of the, you know, the, the gap between our services and what we, what we charge for our services and what the next person who's not licensed charges, right? Yeah. So you'd imagine our market, if you haven't had to pay for your license or get training, if all you've done is just bought your drone and all of a sudden tomorrow you are now the, the drone pilot, okay? And you've got your Facebook page up, your Instagram account, you've got a website, all of this, you haven't, you haven't invested in, in anything, you're not trained, you haven't had to get an ROC. Obviously you're gonna charge a lot less, right? Because all you wanna do is just make money. We come across and then we're like, here's the value of the service, here's the cost. And people are like, oh, you're so expensive. What makes you so special? Why the... So that's kind of our challenge and that's part of what we're fighting. Um, and I'll probably, I'll just leave it there so that Ella can yeah. ask it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, Tawanda. Ella, you had a question for Tawanda. I must say, uh, it's very difficult just coming into the industry and, and you are actually stupid if you, th if you think that you're just gonna go around and get money, that's not how it works. So that my father always had the saying, that money lies on the ground you just have to bend and pick it up and that is exactly what Tawanda is doing um he's doing the work the work is there but he's just using himself to get the, the job done in in the correct way and i think that is something that is awesome i i um it's a very good thing to teach children Tawanda you are you are really um someone we can look up to Thanks, oh, that's very special. That's awesome. yeah. Thank you. And and that's it's and it's hard work picking up that work, right, to wonder, as you were saying, like amongst people who are, you know, pretty much offering this for nothing, and and you are, you know, you're having to run a proper business mm. and charge mm. the appropriate amount. Um, thanks for that uh, comment, Ella. That's that's awesome. Well said. Um, yeah, and uh, Tadendo also said well, uh, well said, Ella. Um, to wonder the the other thing I wanted to, um, I guess you know it's a loaded question because I I know what you're doing and so I want to share this uh, or I want you to share it with the group. But the the fact that you said you know you are required to have an RPL, but there are no training companies or organizations in Zimbabwe meant that you had to self-fund coming to South Africa, spending a couple of weeks in South Africa getting trained. You've just done this recently again at huge expense to come and do your instructor rated certification. Um, so tell us what your plans are. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's I guess it's part of the whole entrepreneurship kind of journey and trying to push through is whatever it is that you want to do, and this goes for everyone, is, you know, um, you just have to see it through. You've got to persist regardless of what the economy is doing, regardless of load shedding, <laughs> regardless of lack of funding. Um, you know, um, I think I, when I made the decision to dedicate myself wholeheartedly, 
it's not so much to the business, but it's more so towards the industry and knowing and understanding that there is a future, um, you know, uh, in this space for other people. So people who haven't had other opportunities and other things, or people who have seen themselves as just being okay, having limited options, it's trying to create a space for everyone else to be able to come and be part and parcel of this. So I always talk about like, you know, your perspective. So perspective is important because oftentimes you, it's, it sounds like, okay, if I have someone who's also doing, trying to do the same thing that I'm doing, then they're taking business away from me, right? Whereas we're like, guys, the pie or the cake is big enough for everyone, okay? It's big enough for everyone who's doing things properly, okay? <laughs> I'm not having a conversation with people who don't want to, you know, uh, come up to the level of having the standards we expect um, for you to be an operator in this space, right? Okay, so so it's not about like, it's not, like, it's not, it's not about trying to like keep information to yourself and oh, I've discovered, I've discovered drones. No one here discovered drones, okay? Like, I mean, <laughs> We all have a story of how we got into this space or how we became aware about drone tech. And we talk about that to say 10 years ago, for the most part, okay? There are a few people who can tell you, and I'm always surprised, who can say, I've been doing drones for 15 years. I'm like, oh, really? Wow. <laughs> Didn't realize that there's people like doing that. And I mean, they, look, for fair and fine, the people who've been building the technology and stuff like that for a long time. But for the most part, most of us don't have more than 10 years in this space. I think 10 years is even pushing it, okay? But for me, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to create a platform that allows as many people to get in this space as possible. In my view, drone technology itself, five years from now, 10 years from now, is going to be a common tool used across all industries in different ways and different forms. For construction, the obvious use cases. For agriculture, the use cases are obvious. You know, um, you know, with crop spraying and you know, uh, yield estimations and all this kind of stuff and aerial mapping you know, telecoms with cell tower inspection, all sorts. I mean, we can go across the whole spectrum, right, um, in that regard. But how do we make sure that the people who are doing it are doing it in a safe manner and who have the knowledge and understanding, right? And, all, and also understanding that we're, at a, we're, we're literally, yes, the drone industry started, but the future of it actually is in us innovating and developing solutions for local problems. So I want to see a future where, yes, Zimbabwe is an agro-based economy. So agriculture is a big part of what we do. But I don't want to, for me, the drone industry isn't at its pinnacle, shouldn't be us having the latest DJI crop spraying drones, right? And having every farmer having that. I would rather see a future where we have local Zimbabweans who understand the technology and who can actually build and develop their own crop sprayers, right? With their own solutions. Do you see what I'm saying? That's, that's the future I'm seeing. How do we get people ready for that? Versus just saying, I want to have a crop spraying company, so I must buy the latest drone. I need an investor who can then help me buy the latest drone and I'll keep buying DJI drones. Look, I'm not against DJI, they're doing great. But we've got to move from a place of being consumers of technology to being developers, innovators, and you know, getting more people involved. So I love people who are like repair and maintenance technicians, for example. We don't talk enough about that because I'm like, they're right there where they could cross over from being a technician to being a creator and developer of the technology easily with the right connections and bringing maybe an aeronautical engineer, someone who can design a drone because you're understanding the tech, you're with it every day, you know? And I'm taking that from my experience with FPV drones and building it and understanding the technology. So anyway, long story short, like Kim said, I can talk all day. I won't do that. Okay, what we're doing is we are starting a training school, okay? Um, and we're gonna have a training school, but a training school that's different to the schools that are currently available right now. So we're setting up a school that's going to be an all-inclusive integrated. We're combining our, and think about it this way, right? We're combining our youth education program, that's drones and STEM, where we're reaching out to kids between seven and 18. We'll be teaching them the basics, right? Of drones, applications, ETC. We're also teaching them coding, so right? Programming drones and carrying out autonomous flight missions, ETC using telos, blah, 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 drone blocks, all that stuff, okay? Then I'm bringing in an advanced course for the youth where we'll be teaching them how to actually assemble racing drones, right? Okay, which prepares them for the future of being a repair maintenance technician if they're interested in doing that. You see what I mean? By the time they're 18, and depending on, even if you start at 16, it's fine. It doesn't matter. You don't have to, you don't have to start at seven. But by the time you're 18, you're now ready to get your license. But you can decide, do I want to be a repair maintenance person? Do I want to actually operate drones? But the understanding you'd have as a child is that it's not just about the flying and getting the license. It's really about how we use the technology to solve problems, right? And seeing beyond 
the, oh, this drone is cool and it flies and look at my latest drone. No, 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 we, we have to move beyond that. So our school will have that part. We will then have the professional uh, licensing, which is the RPL and the licensing. And, the, uh, and that's the your normal RPL, your instructors, your BB loss ETC. Then on top of that, we're gonna have what we call industry specific training, which is which for me, I've been crying and saying, guys, globally, right? Doesn't matter where you are in the world. There's a huge gap there, right? So much focus is placed on just the basic training, okay, of pilots and you get your license, but having your license is like, doesn't actually mean much to be honest, I'm sorry, okay? It's just a starting point, right? What you need now is the advanced training or industry specific training where you get trained on the specific industry you want to operate in. So agriculture, for example, we need drone pilots for agriculture who are trained on all the different use cases for agriculture. That's currently not in any of the curriculum or the modules being trained at, at the RPL level, right? So that's what we're trying to do now is we're actually developing those programs. Some of them are ready now. Um, so you will hear of the launch in a couple of months, um, but our school is integrated. So we offer the seven to 18, the licensing, then also that advanced level where we're like, okay, come, all right. So you're, you've got RPL holder. You need to now know about drones in agriculture, drones in mining or surveying or uh, anti-poaching or you know, medical drone deliveries, right? Which is also where now Zimbabwe Flying Labs comes in and we're like, okay, you know, we've got already you know, the training for drone, medical drone delivery systems, right? We've got the training uh, material required for people to understand how that's done. I'm not saying we're doing it yet. I'd love for us to be doing it, but because of Flying Labs, we have the material, we, the research is there, and there's actually a course that we can actually now offer to say, okay, you want to do drone deliveries in a medical context? Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to consider. Here's how you engage the community that you're going to be operating in. If you're operating from a rural, uh, from an urban uh, space to a rural uh, space, here's how you talk to them about drones. You can't just go into the space and be like, we're amazing, we have technology, so we're gonna come and do this. The people in the rural spaces need also to be trained and understand what drones are and the impact and what to, safety and ETC. So there's a lot going in there, but I'm really excited about it. And I'm really excited about getting people job ready that by the time they come out of this, they can actually go into a space and be like, okay, here's how the drone works in this, not here's my license. So give me a job, you know, type of thing. Anyway. 100% Tawanda, so well said. I have a follow-up comment slash, yeah, comment, but um, Ella has her hand up. Ella, go ahead. Yes, I would like to know, Tawanda, I am, I've studied fixing things on the mine and it's um, easier fixing drones. It's the same, it's a, it's a high qualification, but DJI requires you to go to China to be certified to work on DJI drones. So how can you help with that so that someone doesn't have to go to China? Um, does this, your cert certificate cover that? Yeah, thank you, Ella. Um, so, so, so right now we, we aren't certified by DJI to do the repairs and training like an RMT through that. That's something we're working towards. So eventually, yes. So that's not immediately available right now. The area that we're focused on is on the specific industry context. So if you wanna use drones for agriculture, we'll teach you on the application part. When it comes to repairs, right? In that space, especially, and I know you are, you're an RMT, right? Yes. Yes, you're an RMT. So that, that space, even right now, like it's very, there's very limited spaces and areas where you can go get training. Like you said, you need to go to DJI. So eventually we want to get to a space where our RMTs, right, and the courses that we offer can train other RMTs, okay? So that, that'll be a conversation, yes, with DJI, but not just with DJI, because I don't see DJI, you know, being the only one there five, 10 years from now type of thing, right? So we want to be able to then add those uh, courses. So we can say, we're going to train you as an RMT for DJI this, you know, and within DJI, you've got the what you call the professional series and the enterprise series, ETC. So there's a lot of different things that we're going to build on, but we're starting to lay the groundwork. So right now, all we're really focused on right now is the foundation. So the only area we're offering that is with the youth, right? We're teaching them, we're gonna be teaching them how to assemble racing drones, right? Get the fundamentals, teach them the past ETC. Then when we have RNT course, we'll bring that in. Yeah. To wonder and remember the RMT, 
um, certification in South Africa is actually a CAA determined um, qualification with that criteria. So DJI hasn't said it, they don't care. <laughs> it's, it's the CAA that says, if you are certified to fly BV laws, then you need your own RMT. And that mm. RMT has to be an official CAA RMT. And the only way to get that is to have gone to China. Exactly. So, so it's a CAA thing. So in Zimbabwe, you, you may influence the regulator not to determine that. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> Try and see. You might say to them, as long as the person's like Ella is an actual instrument technician, she's a trained, mm. qualified technician. Mm. So, you know, if she's read manuals and she's been taught by another RMT, why wouldn't that be good enough? You know, go to, and by the way, I think this is unspoken. I'm not sure. So, if I misquoted, there's my caveat for the recording of this thing. But I understand that some people literally just go to China and go and attend a conference. And then that's your step to say you've been to DJI. You haven't really spent time in their factory. That's what I've heard. I'm not sure that's 100% incorrect. <laughs> but how do they know you've spent, you know, a month in their factory learning how to do? I mean, what what are you doing on a on a Mavic? Like you can't even open it up. It's not even a you know what I mean? Like the normal servicing and stuff. I mean, you can, Ella, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you, you know, a lot of the stuff is just like, you know, components. So what, you just sitting in the in a factory for a month figuring out how it's, I don't know. They also need special tools. You, you, you don't use your normal toolbox tools. Oh. So you need specialized tools for it as well. So you won't be able to open it just because you like to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I want to see those tools, Ella. Have you got them? You've obviously got them, right? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, does anyone else have any comments or questions? Um, Charmaine says, uh, clear vision. Uh, exciting to hear what the future holds. Thanks, Tawanda. Um, Thanks, Titi says, so informative and real. Thank you, Tawanda. Thanks, um, uh, Desi, totally agree. I think that was, uh, I can't remember what that comment was on. I saw it come through and I thought I'd remember, but Tawanda, you are fantastic. Desi says, our, our drone diva. Um, so yeah, you've had some really nice comments, Tawanda. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Tawanda? Um, okay, so I I had a I had a final um, kind of follow follow up comment um, for you, Tawanda, and and that was really around where you said because you and I chatted the other day, right, about your, your, um, your plan for your, your training organization and the fact that you want to get people job ready and you want to give them specific training. But the other angle I thought you, you might want to highlight is the fact that, and there was one group that's doing some uh, kind of incubation and, and training programs here in, in South Africa, where I thought their take on actually getting people job ready is really good. And that is about doing specific training for a specific industry, but attracting candidates for that training from the industry. So if you're wanting to do training on how drone tech can be used in the surveying space, train engineers. So they already know what the problems are that need to be solved, right? Okay. So now you teach them drone tech and you train them as a drone pilot. Um, okay, and we're specifically talking about pilot training now, but you're training them to use an extra tool that they're going to have in their toolbox, but they already know the problems to solve. Um, you know, what, you know, whether they're mechanical engineers or whatever, whatever engineering or surveyors, um, or you know, people that have studied agriculture. They know how drone tech can help them, you know, with their with their crop management and and what have you. So now you teach them drone tech. Now they can go back to the industry and go, ha! Now I'm going to be a better farmer or a better, you know, consultant or 
engineer or whatever. So that that's another thing around, you know, attracting people who might not even know they want to get certified. But as soon as they understand how that can help their industry, you know, you've got a whole, you've got a whole nother market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so with that, just if I could add is, is really, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really part and parcel of, I guess the heart behind what we're trying to do. Um, when we looked at it, even especially with the uh, through Zimbabwe Flying Labs and our work there, Zimbabwe Flying Labs, um, whenever we do projects uh, through Zimbabwe Flying Labs, we always um, make sure that we bring on board with us um, university students, right? Who may be involved in the space that we're involved with. So for example, we're, we're doing a wetland project right now. We're doing um, aerial mapping of one of Harari's wetlands to try and gather data that's going to help them. So help them with data action, right? So data, or more data driven decision making. So we're trying to look at the impact of encroachment of people who are, you know, trying to build houses in the wetlands area or who are doing farming in the wetlands area and the extent of the impact. So we brought on board when we started doing the mapping aspect, in fact, at the beginning of the project is we brought on about seven students uh, who are doing environmental science management or something like that from the local university here. So we always try and bring that on board. And in doing nice. that, we brought on, on board the lecturer as well. So now we're trying to get into a space where we're like, okay, you know what? Just like what you said is that drones fit in so many different industries and spaces. So it only makes sense. And what should happen is that there should be a module or part of the curriculum, right? If we're looking at our education systems, right? is any university student or, you know, who's doing any kind of program, even if you're like, like you said, an engineer, all engineers should be trained on, or at least know about how drones are used in their space. Okay. Um, all in my view, all medical doctors, right? If within their five year, six year, whatever, seven year course, they should be at least one week or one day where they're taught about medical drone <laughs> delivery systems, right? right understanding exactly. the pilots, but they should have the understanding of how the tool helps to deliver the healthcare right yeah and across yeah. the board so so part of what we're trying to do is to do that and we've actually been doing training we did a we did an actual training with um or just a bit of a training with uh, some students in an agricultural university in nigeria actually uh, a couple of months back we were doing that and purely focusing on how to make them ready for um you know uh you know, impact within their spaces using drones. So I 100% behind you and I believe in that 100%. We need to really focus on, you know, uh, our training institutions, our education institutions, yeah. and get people to understand it, even if they're not going to be pilots. They should yeah. just know about drones. So Wanda, we have to bring you back. Once, you've, once you're up and running and you've got some, um, you know, results and um, some feedback, we'd really like to have you back on and, and talk about your success uh, on that basis. Um, there are a couple of comments and then we need to wrap up these, um, these sessions just always, you know, run away with us and, and we run out of time. But um, uh, Sharon says, thank you to Wanda, great work. Thanks for sharing with us. Tadenda says, glad to have been uh, oh, where is this now? Um, part of this today's session, I'm energized. Great event, uh, Kim and Louise. Um, uh, yeah, so brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We've had some new, new um, friends on here today, which is uh, wonderful. And please join us again. Um, these are are just wonderful sessions where we all walk away energized and inspired and um, having learned something so please join us again join women in drones as a as a member it's a beautiful platform um, there's lots of things to come and um, Tawanda as always it's a great pleasure to hear you speak and share about what you're doing and um, you know really your passion rubs off on us so um, if there isn't anyone else who wants to make a closing comment uh, or has a question, then I will call this fireside chat closed. Okay, have a great evening and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.